cross. John 3.16 is simple to understand, at least in principle. It contains within it the entire purpose of Jesus coming to this earth. And it's familiar. It's a simple passage that we're all familiar with. I think pretty well everybody can quote it, even if they never go to church. They can recite it. They know all about the words. But what about knowing it in our hearts? What about the reality of the message of hope and love that is contained within that verse for us? And my purpose this morning is to show really just how simple, how simple the gospel is, but with profound consequences. The gospel is simple, but the consequences are profound. The consequences go far beyond many of the thoughts that we might have. You know, in the Old Testament, God had ten standards for living. He had ten commandments, and they were, they were there displayed, and people knew how they had to meet God's standards. And he gave Moses the Ten Commandments and to show him, really, to show mankind what God was like and what God felt was best for mankind. But mankind couldn't keep those commandments. And the selfish acts of disobedience that related from that, the Bible calls sin. That's a fairly simple word, quite emotive these days. But when mankind failed to keep the commandments that God gave, the standards for living, sin came into this world. And sin is something that every one of us experiences in our lives. Whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, it's a reality. And today, we still can't keep the Ten Commandments. That's the problem. None of us can keep them. So you've kind of got an impossible situation that we come in with when we come out of the Old Testament. We read in Romans 6.23, six simple God-forsaken words. The wages of sin is death. Six words. The wages of sin is death. What an awful situation we're in as mankind. That naturally speaking, because we have no ability to keep God's laws, that the only hope for us is death. But if the Old Testament was about God's standards for living, the New Testament is about God's standards for loving. And I really want to emphasize this morning because I want you to understand the magnitude of what Jesus did when he died at the cross. Ten things, very quickly, that he did. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Everyone's heard that voice, that verse. Everyone understands the words, I guess. But we find ten dimensions of God's greatness in it. Firstly, simply the greatest power in the universe. You know, it's incredible to think that an almighty God wants a relationship with you and I. That staggers me, at least, as we start to look at this passage. And uh, the first word in in the little verse, God so loved the world. In the beginning, God created, we read in Genesis 1. God was the one who made everything that surround us. And then it goes on to just show, when we read the creation story, just how great God is when he put the stars in place and the planets and, and so on and the animals and the birds all came into existence. And he made mankind. And David said in Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. We're talking about measuring with the children. I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And in Psalm 8, David said, When I consider your heavens, and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? That's my question, really. Why should God, almighty God, care at all? The greatest power in the universe is God's. He's awesomely powerful. But the greatest love in the universe, God so loved the world. You see, given that God is so powerful and so holy, why on earth should he bother with me or you who are incapable of even keeping a simple commandment? We can't go through a few hours of the day without thinking a bad thought or doing something not quite right. We're all conscious of that. We know that intrinsically we're sinful people. And yet we find here God so loved us. It was a great love. It was an immeasurable love, as we thought with the children. Even back in the Old Testament, the miserable prophet Jeremiah, you remember him? He's a great bundle of laughs if you ever want to have a read. And Jeremiah said, 
The Lord appeared to us and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. See, the Father heart of God goes way, way beyond our concept of love. You see, our love in human terms is very often reciprocal. We expect something back for our love. The best kind of human love, maybe not, but in general, it's a reciprocal love. God's love is outrageous. God's love is unreasonable. God's love is undeserved. And he pours it upon us. Pours it upon us. The greatest love in the universe. And then the greatest beneficiary in the, wor the, wor the universe, the world. Human beings manage to love a few people. If we're fortunate, we manage to love a few in our lifetime. And some, sometimes quite deeply. But as I was saying earlier, I think it's usually in a reciprocal way. But what we find with God is he loved the world. I mean, I don't know about you, but I find it quite difficult to love even my next door neighbor sometimes. God loved the world. How big is that love? And when you think how desperate our world is, it's, it's incredible that God so loved the world. So loved it. Even back in the Old Testament, he, he was showing that. And God loved the world, every man, woman, and child that's ever lived, past, present, and future, with all their faults, with all their sin, with all their rebellion, with all their failure, God so loved the world. Which means that that includes all of us, doesn't it? It includes the people even that we don't particularly like or don't particularly think that God should love, but he loves them. Never have there been so many deeply loved people. Never has there been more a uh, more undeserved beneficiary than the world in which we live. But what's more, God didn't just feel love. He acted upon it. He acted upon it. We read that he gave the greatest unselfish act in the universe. He gave. God had the right to demand something of us. I have nothing by right from God. My very breath, the next breath I take, is only because of God's great goodness and love. I have no right to have anything, to demand anything of him. And he had the right to demand everything of me. And yet, he gave. He gave. Why should a God of the universe, with simple people like us, give? But he gave. And he not only gave us life... Not only did he create the world, not only did he give us all of the food and the free will and the fellowship and the things we enjoy in this life and the skills to enjoy it, he did it in spite of our rebellion, in spite of the fact that mankind, for the most part, wants to paddle their own canoe. They want to make their own rut in life. They don't want God involved. But God still had that, that greatest unselfish act. It must be the most unselfish act. I mean, most of us are quite selfish if we're honest. You know, we'll give a present at Christmas. We rather hope that somebody might give us one back if we're honest. Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you're much more perfect. But God had an unselfish act with no prospect of anything back. Staggering that he gave. But it's more, more staggering still what he gave. The one, his one and only son, the greatest present in the universe. There's never been a better present than that. We might have a present at Christmas time or birthday. It's really difficult, I think, to enter into this simple truth. When our oldest grandson, Micah, was born, he was very sick. Um, and immediately he did a serious operation. And then he went straight into intensive care. And our hearts went out to him. There was many people praying for him. And we were really concerned about him because we loved him so much and we loved the family. And we were so grateful to God that the birth was brought to fruition and that he came through the operation and he was saved. At his dedication, his parents, and I actually did the dedication looking back, they gave their one and only son to God's safekeeping for the rest of his life. And they were so grateful that God had saved their baby from this awful situation that he was born with. But Micah, although dedicated to God, has not had to die. But God, because of his love for you and I, gave himself. The greatest present is one and only son. And he was tortured for something he didn't do. He was crucified for something he didn't do. He died for something he didn't do. The greatest present in the universe. Why? Because God loved you and I so much. 
And he knew we couldn't do anything for ourselves. He knew we couldn't drag ourselves up our boot laces. And so he gave his one and only son to experience rejection and torture and death and separation from him. He did it because he loved us. He did it because he loved me, he loved you. And he wanted, through the presence of Jesus, to give us something we could never, ever have had any other way. We could never have earned it ourselves. We could not have never gone our way into a relationship. We got any other way but through Jesus. And what's more, he gave us forgiveness from sin. Isn't forgiveness fantastic? The fact that you have nothing hanging over you, that God has wiped the slate clean. He gave us freedom from judgment. We don't face God's judgment because of what we were in the past, because Jesus died for that sin, past, present, and future. And he gives us eternal life. All of these things are coming from a God who loved us outrageously and gave the greatest present ever, his own son. And then there's the greatest uh, opportunity in the universe. Whosoever. See, Jesus died for you and I, and I guess in, a, you know, in our better moments we can think, yeah, well, Jesus died for us, but uh, you know, I don't particularly think he died for that awful person down the road, or that person there has been a bit, bit bad, you know. Jesus couldn't die for them. So we kind of have a grading in our own mind of who Jesus ought to die for. But the Bible says, whosoever. There is no barrier, no limit. There is nobody who is bad enough or has gone so far that God's love in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ can't reach them. Whosoever really means what it says. Anyone, anyone can, it, can gain the greatest gift of God and come and experience eternal life and eternal forgiveness. It doesn't matter what background, age, culture, religion we've been in. We are one of the whosoevers. I don't know whether you're happy about this morning. You look quite sort of staid this morning. But you're a whosoever. Do you know that? You're a whosoever. And that's fantastic. That there's no limit. I can be in that batch. It's not a lottery or a competition prize draw where only some people win. Everyone who takes the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal saviour, whosoever has that present of the Lord Jesus Christ and forgiveness. But there is one con con condition. The greatest object of faith. We have to believe in him. That's the thing. You can't have this gift unless you accept it. It's a present that must be open personally. We individually have to take that gift. I think it's quite possible there might be a number of people in this church who would consider themselves to be Christians, who outside of this church when talking to people say, well, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian for years. But the point is, have you ever personally opened the present of God's love? Have you ever personally said, Lord Jesus, I give you everything I am, everything I have, unconditionally, in the way you gave yourself to me, and henceforward I want to do what you want me to do? You know, that's being a Christian. A Christian isn't something with a label. A Christian links us inextricably to Christ. Christ in me. Christ in you. And it transforms the way we are and the way we live. Fantastic that it's everyone that can receive this gift and has one condition. We've got to accept it. Tragically, so few do. We read in uh, John 1.11, he came to his own, but his own would not receive him. You know, sometimes we put conditions on receiving Jesus. I've heard people say, you know, when I get older, I'll do it. Um, I've got to do a few things before I sort of sort this out and so on. But nothing is worth a candle without faith. Nothing is worth a candle without faith. Everything we do, everything we strive for, everything we're involved in has no meaning eternally. When we go from this earth and we die, as we all will, there is nothing to hang on to then of anything we've done in this life. You can have the greatest wealth, you can have the greatest houses, you can have the greatest friends, you can have the greatest loves. But when you go into that box, you go on your own into eternity to face a lost eternity or a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you and gave himself for you. There's only two choices. And every individual has to make that choice. We have to believe in him. See, it, make, it means making a commitment. And commitment is a dirty word these days. People don't like the word commitment. You know, if you say to somebody, you know, can, can you come to the church at three o'clock? Um, 
A lot of people will do that. Some people get there at half past three. Some people might not turn up at all. Some people turn up and say something more important has cropped up. You know what it's like? We live in a world where commitment is quite, kind of quite open-ended. Commitment, if it suits me, is kind of our version of commitment. But where Jesus is concerned, it's got to be real commitment, real belief, real submission to him. It says this life, uh, this, uh, it says in the, in the New Testament these words, this is the word of faith we have proclaimed, that if you confess your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We have to confess in our hearts and believe in our hearts that God raised him then. We will be saved. Romans 10, 13 and 14, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Unless you believe that Jesus is the son of God, unless you believe he died for you, unless you've made that personal commitment, you do not have a relationship with Jesus. It will not get you into heaven. And my plea this morning, my, my heartfelt sense inside me when I was preparing this is, I just want to see you all there. I just want to see you all there. God's heart doesn't want to see anyone perish. Nobody. And we can dress all these things up, but it's so important that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the greatest escape in the universe, shall not perish. So I mentioned earlier on the, 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 these words, the wages of sin is death. It's the great leveller. We are all going to die. And we're going to die spiritually. Sorry, physically, not spiritually. But we can avoid separation from God forever. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, Those who are perishing perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And so they will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in the way of wickedness. And Jesus too said, and we know these words so well, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one. So the message is for whosoever, and no one gets there without going that route. So this, this business that you sometimes hear about, all roads lead to heaven. As long as I have faith, I'll be okay. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what Jesus said. And we have to decide whether what Jesus said actually is counting. So believing in him is the antidote to perishing. And then the greatest certainty in the universe. It's a certainty because the promise is made by God. You will have. You will have. It's not a maybe. You're going to have it. He's utterly reliable. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. And certain of what we do not see. Psalm 145, 13 says, The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. See, you can rely utterly on God. There's not many things we can rely on in this life, is there? But we can rely utterly on God. And when he says that it's going to be given to us, it is going to be given to us. You will have eternal life. And eternal life is the greatest possession in the universe. See, when we receive the love and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died and rose again, he made it possible for you and I as we place our faith in him to also have that eternal life that he had. It's not that we deserve it. It's because we place our faith in him, he comes to live in us, and his eternal life becomes ours. We should have eternal life. Not just a length of life, but a quality of life quality of life which begins on this earth and goes on into eternity you see it's not just some weird crusade about living longer you hear about people being frozen don't you cryogenics and they'll be brought around all that. it's not any any about that this is about a, the minute i place my faith in the lord jesus christ his eternal life becomes mine and when i pass from this life it's a stepping stone through eternal life into his presence wonderful Jesus said in John 6, 47, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. See, totally certain. He who believes has everlasting life. 1 John 5, 11 says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward and unequivocal. Let me read it again. 
He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have the Son? Is the Son of God your most precious companion? Does the Son of God dictate the way you live? Are you enjoying his company? Are you looking forward to being with him forever? Because if we have the life of God in us, right, we will have that attitude. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And while I'm on the subject, I think it's quite in interesting, isn't it, that quite a lot of Christians will look miserable. Uh, if you've got the life, we ought not to spend our whole life looking miserable. Just a side sideline, really. And the other thing is, if we have life, and we have all of this that God's given us, how dare we moan about things? And our biggest problem in our, our, our society today is we moan and we get miserable. That's what's happening outside the doors. In my heart and in your heart, Jesus lives. The light is shining. The life is within us. And we're just so grateful for all that he has made available to us. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So that lovely verse, it's all about God's standard for loving, not just about his standard for living as the Ten Commandments, but this verse, God's standard for loving. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But we can only receive that gift if we ask for it. I want to close now because time has gone by. I'd just like to, um, to read just something very shortly. Um, I came across it this week and I, I thought it was very precious. And it's called John 3.16 and the Homeless Boy. It goes like this. In the city of Chicago, one cold, dark night, a blizzard was setting in. A little boy was selling newspapers on the corner. The people were in and out of the cold. The little boy was so cold that he wasn't trying to sell many papers. He walked up to a policeman and he said, Mister, you wouldn't happen to know where a poor boy could find a warm place to sleep tonight, would you? You see, I sleep in a box up around the corner there and down the alley and it's awful cold in there for tonight. Sure it would be nice to have a warm place to stay. The policeman looked down at the little boy and said, You go down the street to that big white house and knock on the door. When they come out of the door, you just say, John 3.16 and they'll let you in. So he did. <laughs> He walked up the steps, knocked on the door, and a lady answered. He looked up and said, John 3.16. The lady said, come on in, son. She took him in, and she sat him down in a split-bottom rocker in front of a big old fireplace, and she went off. The boy sat there for a while and thought to himself, John 3.16? I don't understand it, but it sure makes a cold boy warm. Later, she came back and asked him, are you hungry, she, he said. Well, just a little. I've eaten in a couple of days. I haven't eaten in a couple of days, and I guess I could stand a little bit of food. The lady took him in the kitchen and sat him down to a table full of wonderful food. He ate and ate until he couldn't eat any more. Then he thought to himself, John 3.16. Boy, I sure don't understand it, but it sure makes a hungry boy full. She took him upstairs to a bathroom, to a huge bathtub filled with warm water, and he sat there and soaked for a while. As he soaked, he thought to himself... John 3.16, I sure don't understand it, but it sure does make a dirty boy clean. You know, I've not had a real bath in my whole life. The only bath I ever had was when I stood in front of that big old fire hydrant and they flushed it out. The lady came in and got him. She took him to a room, tucked him into a big old feather bed, pulled the covers up around his neck, kissed him goodnight and turned out the lights. As he lay in the darkness and looked out the window at the snow coming down on that cold night, he thought to himself, John 3.16, I don't understand it, but it sure makes a tired boy rested. The next morning, the lady came back and up and took him down again to that same table full of food. After he ate, she took him down again to that same big old split bottom rocker in front of the fireplace and picked up the big old Bible. She sat down in front of him and looked into his young face. Do you understand John 3.16? She asked gently. He replied, no, Mum, I don't. The first time I ever heard it was last night when the policeman told me to use it. She opened the Bible to John 3.16 and began to explain to him about Jesus. Right there in front of that big old fireplace, he gave his heart and life to Jesus. He sat there and thought, John 3.16, I don't understand it, but it sure makes a lost boy feel safe. You know, I have to confess I don't understand it either, says the writer, how God was willing to send his son to die for me. 
and how Jesus would agree to do such a thing. I don't understand the agony of the Father and every angel in heaven as they watch Jesus suffer and die. I don't understand the intense love for me that kept Jesus on the cross till the end. I don't understand it, but it sure does make life worth living. See, John 3.16, he lets you in, keeps you warm, satisfies you, cleans you up, gives you rest, makes you feel safe, makes life worth living. My question is, do you understand? You may not understand the depth and the magnitude of John 3.16, but do you understand the love that is behind that, that God passionately cares for you? And each of us have to make our own decision for Jesus. Some of you may never have done that. You can do it this morning. You just have to say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Please, please, save me. Give me your eternal life and help me to walk with you. And for those of you who do know the Lord Jesus Christ, don't get cankered, as it's so easy for us to do. Don't get loaded down with religiosity and all of the theory. Just receive in your heart the wonder of the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have 